On a quiet night in 1912, an entire family and their two guests were brutally and savagely bludgeoned to death with an axe. The killer had hidden in their home for hours and viciously ended their lives in the night. And to this day, we do not know who it was. The idea of someone hiding in your home while you're unaware for hours waiting to do you harm is one of the most frightening things ever. And today we will be covering this terrifying story that shocked an entire town as part of our Halloween themed video lineup. This is the story of the victims, the town, and the suspects of the Velisca Axe murders. Over 111 years later, and this murder remains unsolved and known as one of the most horrific crimes in American history. And this sounds like the plot straight out of a 1980s slasher. But it is no murder committed by Michael Myers. This is a true crime case that just sounds like the plot of a gory 80s slasher movie. So let's get to it. Cover this depraved and scary true story. Uh, definitely Spino. This is some pretty graphic stuff. Even version 2, the unstable, aggressive hybrid dinosaur in my novel didn't go this far. He just ripped some people apart. Let's move on. In this video, we are going to investigate the case, cover the backstory of this horrific tragedy, and do a suspect lineup and see if we can't reach a conclusion on who did it. Let me know what you think, and let's get right into it. First, I want to say that while the true crime aspect of this is fascinating, and I know that some people are just here for the murder, I do want to emphasize that I'm going to approach this story with as respectful of a tone as I can. Because, you know, it happened over 100 years ago, yes, but the victims, they, they were people, you know, just as complex and alive as any of us are today. And some of them were very young children, so I want to just emphasize that and say now that I'm going to address this, giving the victims all the respect that they deserve. Now, first off, let's set the scene by establishing the victims themselves. The Moore family consisted of parents Josiah and Sarah Moore, their four children, Herman, Mary, Arthur, and Paul, who was the youngest of the children at just five years old. On the night the murders occurred, Mary had also invited two friends over to spend the night, Lena Stillinger and Ina Mae Stillinger. The Moores themselves were described as well-liked within their community. Very nice people and not having an enemy in the world, which makes the violent end they suffered all the more horrific and tragic. The evening of the murder itself, the family had actually just returned home from an event at their church, an event that Sarah had helped coordinate. The family returned home at about 9.30 p.m., and the reason that the two friends were coming along was because they were actually just afraid to walk home in the dark. They returned home and everything seemed fine, and that was the last time that they were ever seen alive by anyone save their killer. Just like that. They were brutally slain in the night, and they were found the next morning. So with the backstory out of the way, let's start looking through the clues and the crime scene. The first hints that something was wrong came the next morning when neighbors didn't see the family outside doing their morning chores. These were things that they did just about every day, and not seeing anyone outside did get some people's attention. Eventually, one neighbor, Mary Peckham, knocked on the door to see if anything was wrong, but no one answered. So she tried to open the door, but it was locked. Unable to get inside to check on the family, Mary decided that she'd be helpful and let the family's little dinosaurs out. And then she went and called Josiah's brother, Ross Moore. He also received no response from the family when he knocked. Finally, he got out his key to the house and opened the door while Mary stayed on the porch. Ross went inside and opened the guest bedroom door once inside the house, and there he found Ina and Lena Stillinger. Their bodies were on the bed, bloody wounds in each of their heads, with brain matter splattered on the pillows. Lena was positioned in such a way that it was unclear if she'd been moved by the individual responsible for the horrifying scene, or if she'd woken up and tried to fight or get away. Ina, meanwhile, was on the right side of the bed, facing her sister, who was on the left. Positioned in such a way that her hindquarters were pointing towards the lamp, likely having been moved to such a position by the killer for his own... enjoyment. Once it sank into Ross what he was seeing, he ran outside and told Peckham to call Henry Horton, also called Hank, 
who was Velisca's peace officer, to report the murder. He arrived, found that everyone had been murdered in the same fashion as the first two, and the scene was examined, and here's where the interesting pieces of the puzzle were found, and some of the creepiest and most unsettling ones, too. And here's what they found. The murder weapon itself was an axe, and it was found in the bedroom with the two Stillinger children, likely indicating that they were the last two to be murdered, and as the reconstruction of the events later determined, they were. Two cigarette butts were also found in the attic, indicating that the killer had hidden inside the attic for an extended amount of time, likely the entire time that the family was out, if not before, which is even eerier. It's also known that he waited until after they had come home from church and gone to bed before creeping out and attacking them. The doctors who examined the bodies also found that not everyone was murdered in the same method. The axe was the weapon used in all of the killings, however, only the parents were struck with the blade of the axe. The children, meanwhile, were all struck with the blunt end. Maybe because the killer didn't think they'd be able to fight back as much if the first blow didn't kill them like the parents would have been able to? Maybe he found using the blunt end easier to stomach? Or heaven forbid, maybe he even found it more enjoyable. And I just gotta say, the murders of the parents were especially brutal. If you don't like graphic content, why are you here? But if you don't, and you are, maybe skip to, to, to the timestamp on screen right here. Josiah was the most damaged. He, he essentially didn't have a head. Josiah was slashed with the blade of the axe more than anyone else in the house. His face was so badly cut up and damaged from the blows that his eyes were missing. And again, he essentially didn't have a head above the jaw. The ceiling of the room had gouge marks from where the murderer swung the axe up to bring it down on him. But it was also said by authors that the marks on the ceiling were not made from the attack because of the position they were in, but rather it was from the killer just swinging the axe around in a frenzy, which is even scarier to picture. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night and seeing some guy standing in your dark bedroom just silently swinging an axe around. <laughs> That's creeping me out just picturing it, and how the wife didn't wake up, I don't know. Speaking of her... Sarah was also, as I said, struck with the blade, and after the killer had used the weapon on the children, he came back to the parents and bludgeoned them more with the axe. One shoe he knocked over had even filled with blood from the first attack. After the second attack on the parents, who by then were struck over 30 times and heavily mutilated, was when the killer went down and killed the two guests. You know... That takes a special kind of evil to do that to children. And the attack felt so personal, too. Like, whoever it was had a grudge to settle with the family. You normally don't see this level of violence inflicted on someone if it's a random attack. For that much assault to be put in, it is usually personally motivated on the part of the killer. It's also, as I touched on before thought that Lena Stillinger might have been awake and even tried to fight when she was attacked, which is even worse. That must have been terrifying. A possible defensive wound found on her arm also led some to conclude that she'd likely been the only one to wake up during the attack. It's also thought, though, that she was asleep when the attack on her happened and that the killer had simply moved or pulled her along the bed after killing her. The doctors also found that the killings had occurred sometime between midnight and 5 a.m., meaning it was likely hours, deep into the dead of night, before the killer crept out of his hiding place when the house was dark and quiet. Also, after the killings, the killer laid out a slab of bacon next to the partially cleaned axe in the bedroom where he had killed the two guests, and at some point before 7 a.m., the killer left the house unnoticed. Some other details include there being an uneaten plate of food next to a pot of bloody water, supporting that maybe the killings did happen in the later hours of the night and that the killer was going to have a meal but had to leave before he could because the neighbors were starting to get up. Also, the mirrors and glass on the doors were covered with clothing from the Moore's dressers. I've also seen a theory thrown around a few times that the killer had drugged the food, which is why no one woke up in the attack, 
but there is no evidence of that. I just felt like I should give the idea a mention. So now that we've covered the crime, let's cover the suspects in this sadistic game of Clue. My God, Ross. There's someone murdered in every bed. Hank Horton said to Ross after first entering the home and seeing the whole scene. Unfortunately for the investigation, the story leaked to the public and the home was essentially stormed by onlookers who very likely contaminated evidence or otherwise disturbed the scene. No one would listen to law enforcement telling them to leave. If they were herded out one door, they just came right back in the other one. Despite these trials and tribulations, the investigation moved along and multiple suspects were eventually named. Among them were Reverend George Kelly, Frank F. Jones, William Mansfield, Loving Mitchell, Paul Mueller, and Henry Lee Moore. We're going to go through those individuals in a minute, but in the meantime, this is what happened to the bodies after the murder. Two days after the murder, the Moore Stillinger funeral was held on June 12, 1912, and thousands came. The town square was packed and National Guardsmen blocked the street as the funeral procession for the victims moved through, taking their caskets, which were not on display during the funeral, from the firehouse to the Velisca Cemetery, where they were buried. The cordage for the funeral was 50 carriages long. Also, after the murders happened, fear and paranoia in the town skyrocketed, and all the guns in the town were bought, and you couldn't find new locks for your door anywhere because those were also sold out. It also eventually came to light years later that Villisca was kind of one town in a long line of towns stretching across Illinois, Colorado, and Kansas, and more, all in the line of a railroad, where almost identical killings took place, leading some to theorize that this was the work of an unknown serial killer. The possible connection to suspects in this case, and maybe even the identities of the killers in those cases, will be covered in the next section. So, now that that is covered, let's go through the suspects. Starting with Reverend George Kelly. Shortly after 5 a.m. on the mornings of the murders, the Reverend left Villisca on board the westbound number 5 train. According to a rumor, he told passengers... Eight people had died back in Villisca, even though at the time the bodies had not yet been discovered. Which, if that's true, then how stupid can you be to say, essentially, Hey, there's bodies in town, but they're in their home and no one knows about them yet. So, how's your morning going, fair travelers? <laughs> like, how stupid can you be if you were the guy? Not saying he was, but if he was... That would just be a dumb thing to do. Kelly himself was a traveling minister and was described as peculiar. He was accused of peeping several times and of asking young women and girls to pose nude for him. He came to Villisca on June 8th to teach at the Children's Day services the Moors attended on the 9th, as we've established, and their bodies were found early in the morning on the 10th. Following his departure on the number 5 train, he remained enthralled with the case and often wrote letters to the police and investigators working it, along with the family of the deceased, which started to raise a few eyebrows and make people start thinking that he might know more than he was letting on. He visited the scene of the crime two weeks later, posing as a detective and joining on a tour of the house with a group of investigators, but it was a few weeks later when his rambling letters finally got enough attention. After a series of events which made him really catch the eye of investigators, Kelly was arrested and charged with the murders in 1917. But after two separate trials, he was acquitted of the crime. Kelly also had a lot of mental health problems, so some theorized that the confession he gave, yes he did, was rooted in that and not a legitimate admission of doing the crime. No one else was ever tried for the murders, but there were a lot of other suspects, as I listed off before. So moving on, we have Andrew Sawyer. He was one of the many transients, or strangers in general who were passing through, who was suspected of the murder. He was never charged, but he was interrogated. But like Kelly, he was also obsessed with the murders and would discuss the story with others at work constantly. And he slept in full clothes as if he was prepared to make a quick getaway if the heat turned up on him. And he also slept with an axe by his bed. Not exactly suspicious at best, so the implications are more sick irony. 
Iowa State Senator Frank Jones was also one of the prime suspects. He was a Villisca resident, and Josiah had actually worked for him for years until Moore had opened up a rival implement store to Jones's, which took business away from Jones and led to the two having a very intense rivalry. There is no evidence for this part, but according to a local rumor, Josiah was also having an affair with Jones's daughter-in-law, but take that with a grain of salt. Again, all rumor and speculation, but... No actual proof to support that ever happened. William Mansfield was another of the suspects for being behind the murder. Now, Mansfield is an interesting suspect. One popular theory even suggests that he was paid by Senator Jones to kill the Moore family. Also, as I mentioned earlier, before the killings in Villisca, another set of murders occurred in Colorado, specifically in Colorado Springs, and then two more also occurred in Ellsworth and Paola, Kansas. And like the Velisca killings, these were also committed with an axe. The similarities between these cases led some to consider that they might have been done by the same individual. Also, the method that the Colorado Springs killings were done was a method very similar to the Velisca killings, including details such as the killer covering the heads of the victims with cloth. It was also suspected that Mansfield was responsible for the murder of his wife, infant, father-in-law, and mother-in-law, also with an axe. However, payroll records that were eventually uncovered placed Mansfield in Illinois at the time the murders occurred in Villisca. And there was never enough evidence to bring him to trial. However, another eyewitness said they saw a man matching Mansfield boarding a train who said he had walked from Villisca to the station. If ever proved true, it would disprove that Mansfield was in Illinois when the murder occurred. Another suspect in this case was an individual named Sam Moyer. Now, Sam Moyer, Josiah's own brother-in-law, reportedly had often threatened to kill Josiah, so healthy relationship there. But he was proven to be cleared of being involved with the crime. Another suspect was Paul Mueller, who was brought up when the idea that the killings were actually one of many in a long line of killings by an unknown serial killer. In this case, that unknown serial killer being Paul Mueller. Paul was an immigrant, likely from Germany, who was actually the subject of a year-long manhunt for a murder in 1897 in Massachusetts. It is theorized that Paul was guilty of the Velisca murders, which this, in this theory, would just be part of a decade-long spree of murders that tallied up to 58 people in 14 separate incidents. Many of these crimes had common features as well. One such common trait being that the killer selected families who lived near railroad tracks, and it is thought that the killer moved along the tracks and chose victims along the way as he moved town to town. In these apparent line of killings, the killer had also hidden the homes until his victims were asleep, preferred to use the blunt end of the axe over the blade when attacking victims, who he always struck in the head and face, and also left the axe in the home unhidden after each killing as well as covered the windows of the home from the inside and left the door locked upon leaving. Many agree that this is a likely explanation for the murders, but we're not done with suspects just yet. Now, on to the final of the suspects we are talking about, Henry Lee Moore. Thanks, Spino. Moore was a suspected serial killer, which would make the possibility of all the axe murders at the time being the work of a serial killer make a lot of sense. Like, seriously, this dude was like the axe killer because he was suspected for, oh, so many axe killings across the country. Was that just the thing to do back then? Yeah, I don't know, Spinal. That's a good question. You tell me. Moore was actually convicted of the murder of his mother and grandmother only a matter of months after the Velisca murders, again, his weapon of choice being an axe. The killings of his relatives held striking similarities to the Velisca killings, again, leading some to think that Henry Moore was responsible for those killings as well. Along with Mansfield, Moore was and is considered a very likely suspect in this case. You know, this story is one of those things that just doesn't sound real. This sounds, like I said at the beginning, 
like a fictional story someone wrote to be scary. Like the plot of an 80s slasher that just went over the top with the kills. It doesn't sound like something that actually happened, but the terrifying part is, is that it did. And the killer was a chameleon, blending in and disappearing. And the fact that such young lives were brutally taken, it's all the more horrific. It's one thing when it's happening in fiction, but when something this horrific happens in real life, it hits differently. And I think stories like this should be told. And this is not forgotten. Everyone loves the idea that the house is haunted, and I'm open-minded when it comes to the paranormal. I have my own ghost story, but I think we also need to look past the sensationalism itself and remember the tragedy, the victims, and their story. And this is just a scary story, too. Someone hiding in your house only want wanting to harm you is terrifying. The fact that the killer did that for who knows how long is one of the creepiest parts to me for this whole story. By the way, I'm home alone right now, so this is really comforting to be talking about. You know, I'd never really heard of this case beyond just in passing. In fact, I was looking for a different one for this video originally, but I'm happy I came across this story. It was a very interesting one, and I hope you found the story interesting as well. Now, who do I think did it, if any of those? Well, assuming it really wasn't just a random serial killer passing through the area, and assuming it wasn't one of the suspected serial killers we've covered because... I think both of them could be pretty likely, it's, but with how personal the attack felt, it feels like it was someone who had a grudge and not just a random hit from a serial killer. So with all that in mind, I can't help but wonder if it wasn't the senator who did it or someone from the business Josiah left and had opened a rival one to. Again, the attack was so violent and brutal that I just can't feel like it was random. It was like someone who hated the parents finally snapped. Again, in most murder cases, yes, there are times when it is totally random and horrifically violent, but in most cases when you see this level of violence, it's personal. Like someone is settling a score and playing devil's advocate. If the affair rumors were true, then that's more fuel on the fire, but... Take those with a grain of salt because there's no evidence, but even if there were rumors at the time that, you know, totally unfounded in reality, that might have just really motivated the killer if they already hated Josiah, and we know that Senator Jones did. The amount of violence inflicted on the parents specifically just... Again, you usually don't see that in just random killings. It's usually only from someone with a personal score to settle. And it just really makes me think that it was personal for whoever was swinging the axe. Tell me though, which one of these suspects do you think was the killer, if any of them? And tell me what topics you'd like to see covered. I want to start diving into some of these true crime mysteries going into next year. I've always found this kind of stuff fascinating. And I would love to start actually covering some of it on my channel. Also, if you enjoyed, like and subscribe. It not only helps me grow, but also lets me know that you enjoy contests like this. And you want to see more like it. And it also helps me see what you all are interested in. So I can plan out future topics to be more ones that you'll enjoy. Also, it would mean the world if you checked out some of my original narrated stories on here. I want to become an author and I'd love feedback on them. Passion projects and all that. And stick around too because the Halloween spooky season is just getting started. Coming next week, the terrifying story of a crew being hunted down by an unseen terror. A force that stalked the halls of their ship and drove them mad. Next week, we will be covering the terrifying story of the vessel Ivan Vasily. Till then, don't get too spooked out there, and have a good one, everyone. Thank you for watching.